In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Heavenly King, Paraclete, Spirit of Truth, you who are everywhere present and fill all things, treasury of all that is good and master of life, come dwell within us, cleanse us from all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Mary, cause of our joy, pray for us. As I said that prayer, one of the lines in it, one of these days I want to explain that prayer. It's a prayer from the Byzantine liturgy. But there's one line in it that I usually say, Master of Life. The text says, Zois Korigos. Life, Zoe. Korigos is the, there's two persons called Korigos. They're both regard to the drama, the theater, the one, Cody goes, is the one who supplies, picks up the tab on all the troupe and the actors and actresses and all that, you see? Weren't there any actresses, actors, but what, you know, it was, uh, he, he supported the whole thing materially. But another person is also called Cody goes, and that's the one who leads the choir. He, his gestures, his, his voice. The Holy Spirit is both for us, right? He supplies all that we need and he leads us in the way of life. So he's called the Zoes Corigos. All right? Now we're going to go to work here. Uh, we're going to be looking at Verbum Domini, number 56. It's a bit of a review. We've looked at it before, but it's so important and so uh, necessary for grasping the word of the liturgy. In fact, we're in the section uh, called the liturgy privileged setting for the word of God. And we're in the section that's called the sacramentality of the word. The word is a sacrament. The word causes. And that's the tradition. And Pope Benedict is more forthright and daring, in a way, in this section uh, with a very deep, you could say mystical, understanding of the word of God at the liturgy. So, the sacramentality of the word, this is uh, number 56. Reflection on the performative character of the word of God in the sacramental action and a growing appreciation of the relationship between word and Eucharist lead to yet another significant theme which emerged during the synodal, synodal assembly, that of the sacramentality of the word. The sacraments effect something. Now the word that the Pope uses for that is performative. It's a word that comes from uh, modern linguistics, really. It, a performative word is a word that affects what it signifies. Now, in normal life, that's the result of a societal agreement. The lady breaks the bottle of champagne over the bow of the ship. I now dedicate you, or whatever she says, uh, I, cry, I, I christen you. That's what she says, christen, which is interesting, comes from baptism. I christen you, the battleship, Potemkin, some battleship, okay? That's that battleship's name forever because it's a societal agreement or I now pronounce you man and wife or those sort of things. They're performative language. But you see, there's another way that language can be performative. and That is, if it's invested with the power of the Holy Spirit. I baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. That's just not societal agreement that makes that child baptized. There's a, there's a change in the child. The Trinity begins to dwell there through that word of the gospel and the gesture. I remember we've done this before. Augustine has his famous phrase, Accetit verbum, that's the word, accetit verbum, ad elementum et fit sacramentum. The word comes to the element, in this case water, 
and there's a sacramentum effected. That's the performative character of a sacramental word. This is my body. This is my blood. Uh, may the Lord heal you always. Whenever we anoint somebody for healing, the Lord always does something. I'm 50-something years, six priest, years a priest. I can promise you, no sacrament of anointing that is fruitless. Does it always result in healing? No. But it always results in deeper forgiveness, deeper union with the Lord. That's why as we anoint the hands, we say, May the Lord who frees you from sin, now, freeing you from sin, save you and raise you up. And the background for that word save, of course, as you know, it's sozin in Greek, and it means save and heal, both. And so, uh, let's perform it. Now, the Pope is taking it not only in the sacramental context, but in the biblical context. The biblical word is performative. It brings about something. And you've heard me on this often. Um, St. Thomas talks about how uh, in his commentary on Dionysius that all other words uh, uh, how does he put it? I just want to see if I can get it the way he says it. Nourish, that's the word. All other words nourish the mind. The biblical word nourishes the soul. Now it's about that mysterious quality of the word as it is at the liturgy. Now I know I'm repeating myself from a couple of weeks ago, but I think it's so important for all of us and in a special way, the priest who preaches this, you see. And we're going to read in just a moment, over on the other side. The sacramentality of the word can thus be understood by analogy with the real presence of Christ under the appearances of the consecrated bread, bread and wine. It's like a sacrament. It causes. Just the text I read or the text that I've quoted them, you know them, they're commentarying on Ephesians, and he says, you see, and thus, the power of the word, when joined with the Holy Spirit, without that, nothing, but joined to the Holy Spirit, this word is powerful. And this happened, and these are his words, hic accidit frequenter in sermonibus. This happens often in sermons, that the word, enlivened by the Spirit, drives out, the, the scattered, tangled mass of sins and demons. That's amazing, isn't it? So that's that's Saint, Saint Thomas. So we're, this is the Pope now. Um, reflection on the performative character of the Word of God in the way I've just described, in the sacramental action, and in a growing appreciation of the relationship between Word and Eucharist, lead us to yet another significant theme, which emerged during the Synodal Assembly, that of the sacramentality of the Word. Here it may help to recall that John Paul II had made reference to the sacramental character of Revelation, that's a quote, and in particular to the sign of the Eucharist in which the indissoluble unity between the signifier and the signified, indissoluble unity between what the signifier and the signified, makes it possible to grasp the depths of the mystery. We come to see that at the heart of the sacramentality of the Word of God is the mystery of the Incarnation itself. The Word became flesh. What about the Old Testament? You see, the Word was always present. Always present. All those events, all those words, they are an anticipated participation in the mystery of Christ. The mystery of Christ is present already. This is a common theme in the Fathers of the Church. These things we have to learn to appreciate anew and more deeply. Huh? We come to see that at the heart of the sacramentality of the Word of God is the mystery of the Incarnation itself. The Word become flesh. The reality of that revealed mystery is offered to us in the flesh of the Son. The Word of God 
can be perceived by faith through the sign of human words and actions. Faith acknowledges God's word by accepting the words and actions by which he makes himself known to us. So what is faith's role when we read the scriptures? Receptivity. If we had time, perhaps one of these, when it's apposite, just look at the act of knowledge, you see. Um, I have this book in front of me. I know that book because it's intelligible. But the intelligibility of the book is that it is giving itself to me. The fundamental act of knowledge is an act of receptivity, not an act of domination. And that divides Christian understanding from just about everybody else today. And that's why you find in uh, discussions, you get a, a physicist or a, bi- or a biologist and a Christian to discuss evolution. That there's some form of evolution, there's no problem. You know? The scientist justifies his assertions only by way of physical data. He doesn't philosophize. In fact, he will say there is no such thing as metaphysics without realizing that that's already a metaphysical statement. It's metaphysics. It's beyond physics. Physics has no right to say whether there's such a thing or not. That's beyond physics. If I were to say water does not expand at four degrees centigrade and begin to expand down to zero, what they'd all say to me, anybody would say to me, who knows, get some water, put it in a glass, put the thermometer and put it in the fridge and you'll see for yourself. Empirical evidence, it begins to expand. That's quite correct. But that's not the highest function of the mind. And that's what this text is alluding to, you see. Uh, that we understand the word by receiving it, you see. Uh, the proclamation of God's word at the celebration entails an acknowledgement that Christ himself is present, that he speaks to us, and that he wishes to be heard. So when we're at Mass, we have to listen with our heart, not just our ears. Our spirit has to take this in. And it causes knowledge. It scatters the uh, tangled mass of sins and demons in us. It heals the soul and enlightens the soul and not just the mind and other expressions that come from tradition. Uh, Jerome has one about, when we read the scriptures, just don't look at the leaf of the words. Look at the root of understanding. So the plant is not just leaves. It's root. And the root is understanding. It's intelligibility. Um, I know I'm going back over this because I think it's so important that we all understand this. We've all had the experience of somebody preaching and it pierces our heart. We get a new insight. Or we repent for a sin, or you see, that's the word's normal function at the liturgy, the biblical word. And so that's why this part is so important, and I thought it might be worth going back. Um, we are reading the sacred scriptures. This is uh, Jerome, and we'll stop with this. For me, the gospel is the body of Christ. For me, the holy scriptures are his teaching. And when he says, whoever does not eat my flesh and drink my blood, even though these words can also be understood of the Eucharist mystery, Christ's body and blood are really the word of Scripture, God's teaching. When we approach the Eucharistic mystery, if a crumb falls to the ground, we are troubled. Yet when we are listening to the word of God and God's word and Christ's flesh and blood are being poured into our ears, yet we pay no heed. What great peril should we not feel? That's all. Um, Jerome, Doctor of the Church. 